The Silurian period was a time of consolidation for the many forms of marine invertebrates that had evolved and of recovery from the Ordovician extinction event huge coral reefs comparable in extent to Australia's Great Reef flourished in sunlit tropical seas new genera of fishes appeared in the oceans and freshwater and the first small vascular plants began to colonize coastal areas of the continents. The closing of ocean basins and the rapid melting of ice sheets brought about a significant rise in sea levels helping expand shallow sea environments for corals and fishes Graptolites reestablished themselves after the Ordovician extinction and many species of these colonial animals were pelagic drifting on global ocean currents their rapid evolution short species lifespan and widespread distribution make them invaluable index fossils for correlating rocks and past marine environments around the world. Estimating paleotemperatures is extremely difficult one study of fossil brachiopods puts global temperatures during the Silurian at between 34 and 64 degrees however general consensus is that conditions were very warm glaciation that began in the late Ordovician continued with four major episodes of advancing ice during the first 15 million years of the Silurian when the ice was at its maximum extent it was cold at high latitudes and cool and humid nearer the equator whereas in the interglacial periods high latitudes were cool and lower latitudes latitudes were warm and arid their wide distribution particularly when deposited in low reef environments indicates that warm oceans on tropical and subtropical conditions expanded the Silurian was a short period of time lasting only about 28 million years but during this time the land was invaded by both plants and animals it was a greenhouse period with warm tropical seas bearing rich and diverse faunas but it was also punctuated by a number of short-lived glaciations Plants colonized land during the Silurian greater than animals followed and Silurian millipedes are known both from fossils and the tracks they made when walking marine Silurian scorpions also eventually made the transition onto land. During the Silurian extensive reef systems developed following those of the Ordovician they grew as elongated barrier reefs or as smaller patch reefs. The latter can often be seen in vertical quarry faces one stacked above the Otharan consisting of pale largely unbedded fine calcareous sediment within a normal bedded sequence. These are not strictly coral reefs because like most Paleozoic buildups, as they are properly known, they were constructed by algae the ecosystem was greatly diverse with patrolling cephalopods as the top predators these Silurian environments have been the source of some of the world's best preserved fossils. Stromatoporoids were sponge-like marine creatures that ranged from small to massive and examples are commonly found in both Silurian and Devonian limestones made up of vertical tubes intersected by transverse structures Stromatopora had closely spaced calcitic plates with strong vertical pillars and star-shaped elements called astrorhizae each astrorhiza had a central circular opening from which furrows radiated in an irregular series of markings for years paleontologists were unsure of how to group stromatoporoids now stromatoporoids are best regarded as a separate class of sponge. Favocytes was a tabulate coral that lived in warm shallow seas and formed colonies in a variety of shapes this example is a flattened hemispherical form the individual skeletons or coralites that made up the colony were many sided in cross section their walls were thin and closely packed giving the colony a honeycomb appearance the coralite walls also had up to four longitudinal rows of pores the septath vertical partitions that divided the inside of the coral lights were short and commonly in the form of rows of spines it is unusual to find fossilized remains of the soft body parts although calcified polyps have been found in examples of Silurian favocytes. Heliolites was a tabulate coral that lived in warm shallow seas it existed in different forms. Greater than which could be branching or in massive colonies, the soft-bodied coral polyps would have rested on top of cylindrical skeletons called coralites. In cross-section, coralites were smooth and circular, or had a scalloped edge made up of 12 segments, 12 small, longitudinal partitions may have been present, extending a short distance from the coralite wall. Goniophyllum is a solitary rugose coral, with a distinctive four-sided top section. The soft-bodied coral polyp lived in a concave cavity, called a callus, 
a lid-like structure or operculum, made of four thick, triangular plates, covered the callus, but this is not usually preserved in fossils, contracting muscles shut the lid so that the polyp was protected when not feeding. Tilidictia was an upright bryozoan colony, made up of one straight or slightly curved branch. At the base was a conical socket that allowed the colony to articulate rectangular holes on the surface open to the autozoetia, where the individual soft-bodied animals known as autozoids live. These feeding autozoids had a lophophore, a ring of tentacles surrounding their mouths, which could be withdrawn into the autozoetia when the zooid was not feeding. Leptana was a genus of brachiopods that had ab outward curving pedicle valve or shell with an inward curving brachial valve just inside it, the hinge line was straight, and the beaks of both shells projected above it, the pedicle opening, where the fleshy stalk attaching the animal to a surface protruded, was located just below the pedicle valve beak, the shell surface had strong concentric ribs crossed with fine radial ribs, toward the front edge of the shell was a sharp bend in both valves. Pentamerous was large, with two outward curving valves or shells, its length was usually greater than its width, the pedicle valve beak was prominent, the opening where the animal's fleshy stalk protruded lay just beneath it, its shell surface was almost smooth, but feature fine radial ribs and fine growth lines, inside, a thin dividing wall was located nearest the pedicle beak, and supported a large, spoon-like structure that acted as a muscle attachment area, this feature is characterous. Tick of pentamerid brachiopods, pentamerous often lived in large groups. A tripa was a brachiopod or lamp shell with a flat or slightly outwardly curved pedicle or larger shell and a strongly outwardly curved smaller or brachial valve. The beaks of both shells projected slightly above the hinge line. The shell surface was characterized by strong, concentric ribs crossed by radial ribs. There was a slight outward fold in the brachial valve and a corresponding fold or sinus in the pedicle valve. The supports for the animal's feeding organ, the lophophore, were located inside the brachial shell and were arranged in spirals directed toward the center of the shell. Gomphoceras was a marine mollusk in the cephalopod group, the same class to which a chambered nautilus belongs. The thin walls inside the shell were closely spaced, and it had a large body chamber that narrowed toward the shell opening at maturity. The aperture is missing from this example, but in other fossils final opening was complete but small, with little space for tentacles. This suggests that, at maturity, the animal could no longer feed and died after mating, as do many modern cephalopods. Cardiola was a strongly ribbed bivalve with well-marked growth rings. The shells were of equal size, with prominent beaks. A smooth, triangular area lay beneath each beak with fine growth parallel ribs across it. Internally, two adductor muscles controlled closure of the valves, but there were no hinge teeth. A ligament would have opened the valves when the adductor muscles relaxed. Cardiola was probably attached to the seabed by threads known as byssus, which it retained from its initial settling as a larva. The echinoderms known as crinoids, such as Gisochronus, were marine animals related to sea urchins and starfish, Gisochronus had a small cup made of three circles of plates. In the upper circle, the five radial plates had wide, crescent-shaped upper surfaces. These served as articulation points for the animal's arms, which extended upward from this point. A sixth plate in this circle, at the back of the cup, marked the base of a tubular structure, which ended with the anal opening at its top. The arms branched several times, and the branches were always equal in length. Pseudocrinites was shaped like a round or oval inflated disc, with a flat rim formed by two, thin plated zones called ambulacra. It was anchored to the seabed by a jointed stem. The mouth was set opposite the stem attachment in the center of the oral surface. The ambulacra began at each side of the mouth, and in some specimens reached down as far as the stem. In well-preserved examples, a number of short, articulated appendages called brachioles can be seen. The sockets where they were attached show that they were arranged alternately on each side of the ambulacra. The anus, an opening into the water vascular system, and a gonopore were also located on the oral surface. 
The hard, external shell features rhomboid-shaped areas that are situated across plate junctions, and pairs of slit-like openings that penetrate the shell. The function of these was probably respiratory. Respiratory structures scattered over the cup surface are characteristic features of the class Cystoidea, to which Pseudochronites belongs. Laporthura was a brittle star with a large, central disc area. All of its body openings were located on the animal's lower surface, and its mouth was situated centrally. Laporthura's arms' calcareous plates, known as ossicles, were arranged in pairs opposite each other. Fossilization of brittle stars is usually dependent on the animal being buried alive by the sudden influx of sediment, for example, during a storm. If this does not happen, the soft, outer skin of the organism decays, and the ossicles separate and disperse. Brittle stars, starfish, and sea urchins are all echinoderms, like modern brittle stars, Laporthura was probably a carnivore. The trilobite dalmanites had a large head shield with a prominent, forward widening glabella in the center that featured two pairs of narrow furrows as well as deep, oblique ones. Its eyes were large and set at the back of the head, and had prominent lenses. Its cheeks were gently convex, and extended into robust, broad-based spines. Under the head shield, and attached to it beneath the glabella, was a large hypostome, a calcified structure thought to have enclosed the stomach. The thorax was segmented, and the broadly triangular tail shield ended in a spine. Incranorus was a small trilobite that was widespread in the world's seas throughout the Silurian. As a fossil, it is immediately recognizable from the many prominent pustules on its head shield, which have given it a nickname, the strawberry-headed trilobite. The central part of the head shield, the glabella, was inflated and pear-shaped, widening toward the front. The eyes sat on the ends of short stalks, suggesting this trilobite may have spent much of its time half buried in soft sediment on the seabed, with only its eyes protruding above the surface. This trilobite's head shield had a prominent central raised area that narrowed toward the front, with three distinct lobes. The hindmost was the largest. A curved, raised ridge ran from the front of the glabella to the rather small eyes, which were located on the back part of the head shield, about halfway between. The glabella and the lateral edge, the thorax was composed of ten segments, which laterally tapered into long, curving spines on both sides. The tail shield was small and had two large, backward-pointing spines with a row of four small ones between them. One of the most familiar trilobites, Calamine had a roughly semicircular head shield dominated by a prominent glabella that narrowed toward the front and was broadly bell-shaped. The glabella had three lobes running along each of its two outer edges, and the hindmost of these was the largest. Its eyes were small and located roughly opposite the midpoint of the glabella. This was such an abundant fossil in the limestone quarries of Dudley, England, that it became a local emblem. Monograptus is characterized by having arm-like structures on only one side of its stipe. The Thakai housed the individual soft-bodied zooids of the colony. This genus appeared in the geological record at the beginning of the Silurian period, about 443 million years ago, and a large number of species of monograptus and related genera evolved rapidly over the following 30 million years. Many of these are of worldwide distribution. Graptolites were colonial hemichordates, a small group that is allied to vertebrates. Living hemichordates are comparatively rare, but the abundance of graptolite fossils in many rocks shows that they were once widespread in the planet's oceans. Eurypterids like Paracarcinosoma were scorpion-like animals, and the majority inhabited freshwater of brackish water. In some, the first pair of limbs ended in pincers armed with sharp, pointed teeth on their inner edges. The animal's small head shield is not well preserved on this specimen, but was roughly rectangular, and its small eyes were located loose to the front, the mouth lay underneath, and the first pair of appendages, the small shell acerae, lay in front of it. Paracarcinosoma had four pairs of spiny walking legs, and the sixth, hindmost pair were swimming legs with paddle-like ends. Its abdomen was divided into TW. O parts, a broad, oval preabdomen, made up of seven segments, and a narrower, nearly cylindrical post-abdomen, with five segments. Behind the abdomen was a pointed terminal segment called a telson. Jawless fish were the most common vertebrates of the Silurian. 
However, new vertebrate groups appeared and diversified during the period. The oceans were home to a key development. Finally, the fish. Jaws, and by the end of the Silurian, all the major groups of vertebrates had evolved. The period of glaciation that ended the Ordovician extended into the Silurian, but gradually the ice melted, sea levels rose, and the oceans became warmer. While plants and invertebrates sought to establish themselves on land, vertebrates continued to take advantage of the hospitable environment offered by the oceans, and it was the Silurian seas that saw what is probably the most important advance in vertebrate history, the evolution of jaws. The possession of jaws enabled the development of new types of behavior, with jaws, an object can be grasped firmly, and if those jaws have teeth, food can be sliced into pieces small enough to swallow, while hard items can be ground down, eating plants was now an option, and many jawed vertebrates became larger than their jawless contemporaries, with or without teeth, a strong pair of jaws can also be used to hold on tight to a partner during courtship or mating, and to carry young, objects can be manipulated with jaws, holes can be dug, stones can be moved, and pieces of plants can be used to build nests, the possibilities for jawed vertebrates were many and varied. A small jawless fish, Burkinia had a laterally compressed, fusiform body, it was covered in elongated scales arranged in distinct rows, those on the hind dorsal flanks sloped down and back instead of down and forward, large scales ran along the top of the body, some pointed forward, others backwards, and a double-headed scale in the middle pointed in both directions, Burkinia had a well-developed anal fin, and small eyes with a single nasal opening between them, it lived in freshwater and was an acti. They swimmer that fed on detritus. Atelispus was a primitive osteostracan and is thought to have lived in sheltered seas or river mouths. It is the earliest known fish with paired appendages. Its pectoral fins, it had two dorsal fins, the front one was covered in scales, the hind fin was larger, with webbed spines, Atelispus's head was protected by a bony shield, and bony scales covered of the head, which suggests that Atelispus was a bottom feeder. Laganelia was a thelodont, a flattish fish, with a body entirely covered in scales, and a hypocircle tail. Its eyes were small and fat, apart, the position of its mouth on the underside of its head suggests that it fed on the seabed by sifting through the mud, paired flaps on the side of the head may have functioned as fins. Climatius was a short fish with many short spines, both pectoral fins had a spine, as did the front and rear dorsal fins and the anal fin, and there were five pairs of spines underneath the body, bony armor covered its shoulders, its tail fin was shark-like, with a larger upper lobe, its eyes were large, and its nasal opening small, Climatius had small grinding teeth, which suggested fed on tiny creatures. The earliest known ray-finned fish, Andriolopus had sharp, pointed teeth that were interspersed with smaller tooth-like projections and arranged in several rows, old teeth Sarah not shed, instead, new ones were added along the jaw's inner edge, its scales were diamond-shaped and ridged, and carried a thin layer of a substance called ganwan, which is similar to the enamel found on a tooth. 